Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, Monica. Glad you could come here for a few short hours Thank tonight. Thank you for coming here with me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, quick round uh, of raised hands. How many people here have read the book? OK. Just, just looking to see how much, we, how much I should ask you to explain. Um, should, should we just start with the whole, how did you get into this? How did this uh, book strike your fancy? I know that you did a huge bit of reporting on it for the Washington Post. How did this story um, make you want to be enveloped in it? Yeah, so the book, for those of you who didn't raise your hand or were just looking for a place to sit for a few minutes, um, uh, this book is, is, is called American Fire, um, uh, and now I've forgotten the subtitle, Love and Life in a Vanishing, in a Vanishing Land. It's, it's, a, it's, a true, it's a true story. It's about a series of arsons that took place in 2013 in a rural county in Virginia. And over the course of uh, four and a half months, 85 buildings were burned down, which is a lot of buildings, especially when it's, in it's a, uh, when it's such a, a rural place as it was. So um, I was a feature writer at the Washington Post. I had, had heard about these fires as, as they were going on. And um, once, the, once the arsonists were arrested, it turned out that it was uh, a man and a woman. Uh, I didn't know a lot about arson but I knew enough to know that women do not usually burn down 85 buildings. It's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty masculine crime. Um, and it, it, it just really led me to wonder both what it was like to live in this county at the time it was burning down, and also what could have led two people who were, by all accounts, well-adjusted, well-known, members of the citizenry to, to go burn down the place they lived and kind of fell down that rabbit hole. Um, let's talk a tiny bit about Bonnie and Clyde because you have a little section in the book where you do talk about what motivates uh, a, a, most often a man and a woman to, to work together to commit crimes. Yeah. Um, how were Charlie and Tanya similar, different? Uh, what were their motivations like? So um, <laughs> this is the part at which I never know how much detail to go into because, um, because the, the motives for lighting the fire ended up being both sort of the oldest and commonest and most understandable reasons for committing any crime, which is, which is love. It was, a, it was a love story that happened to manifest itself in burning down half a county. Um, but it was, it was also, uh, it was, it, a, a lot was wrapped up in this crime, which is what became really interesting to me. Um, so this is a story, it's a story about human relationships, it's a story about love, it's a story about sex, it's also a story about um, poverty and pride and rural America and things that get left behind and our vision of America and how America isn't what we what we would like it to be. Um, so so for me, this this was a book, a story about these two individuals, but it was also about these these broader themes of kind of what it meant to be alive in 2013 in this really rural place. And so speaking of I, you you moved down there for a little bit to research the story. To Akamak? Yeah, I, I I rented a house a house down there, um, and I, I'm I'm from a land of cornfields. I'm from Central Illinois, so so it wasn't um, it, it wasn't like I was a complete fish out of water. But it's a really interesting place to be an outsider. It's a it's a place where there's a definite sense of um, of of born there's the people who are from there and um, and come here is the people who they see as sort of usurpers who have who have have come into their communities. Um, I, I was down there before the election, but it's it's Akamak is the sort of place that we very quickly started thinking of as um, as 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 Trump's America, and so that was an easy uh, or a, that was an interesting experience to be down there while the election was was happening and see these uh, uh, 
these 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 feelings come to the forefront about their their place in the country and and how they felt left behind tell me a little more about that like what what is akamak like what did it used to be like give us a little so set up earlier when i was saying that that this is a story about a very real people but also larger themes here's what was fascinating to me akamak county where this is set a uh, hundred years ago at the time of the 1910 census was the wealthiest rural county in all of America. Um, it was it, it was wealthier than uh, than Los Angeles County. It was wealthier. It was it was it did really well. Um, and it had a strong agricultural base and it had a strong farming base and it had uh, it had a strong uh, community because of the railroad that ran right through it. So. A hundred years later, when the fire started, it had gone from being the wealthiest county in all of rural Amer all of rural America to being um, the poorest county in Virginia. Because what happened in Accomack happened is what happens in a lot of America. Um, uh, small family farms were replaced by factory farms. Uh, the railroad left, so that meant that tourism left. That meant that businesses left. Um, there were. Uh, the trucks replaced the railroad. And so instead of having collective bargaining, you ended up having uh, individual farmers sort of racing each other to the bottom of, of prices that were unsustainable. Um, and as all of this happened, the, the county emptied. Uh, 50 years ago, the population of, of Accomack County was 54,000. Um, now it's about 40,000. So that's, that's more than a 20% decline. And what this meant is that there were a lot of abandoned buildings. Um, and so, so the, the geography of the place played a, played a role in these, in these arsons. There were a lot of empty buildings to be burned down. Right. Um, and, and so how did you fit in? Um, you were a come here. <laughs> yeah. But, but you spoke to a lot of the people who fought the fires and responded to the fires and, and kind of went vigilante a little bit in the, in the nicest way possible to, <laughs> is, that, is that fair to say? Yeah, so are, are any of you from rural places-ish? Okay, tell us about the country. <laughs> so um, I have an email that I have saved that I sometimes pull out to read, but I don't have my phone on me, so I'll just, I'll, I'll repeat it from memory. Um, there's a there's a fire chief who becomes a major character in the book, um, whose name is is Jeff Bell. And the first time that I emailed Jeff to see if he would uh, let me come down and interview him, he wrote back, which I'll do my best to quote from memory. Don't you ever fucking contact me again? I will call my fucking lawyer. Leave me the fuck alone. Um, which is which was a common response that I got from everybody. They were really they were really tired of journalists coming down. I mean, this is a place that nobody has ever heard of and suddenly they're in the news and the reason they're in the news is because their their county is burning down. Um, so when I moved down I uh, I I I was trepidatious, but um, you know, you 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 do the thing that journalists learn to do a lot, which is which is just to get people to open up by showing them that you're not you're not going away. And I wasn't just there to ask a couple of questions and then leave. I had I had rented this house. I was going to the uh, to the football games. Like, is there a right. church potluck? I'm bringing green bean casserole. <laughs> like, I'm yeah. I am not I am not leaving. I am here to tell this story, and I hope you can help me tell it well so we, it was a gradual process and and so let's talk a little bit about the the volunteer firefighters who are kind of central in in um solve, uh, helping to stop all of these terrible fires from spreading um tell us a little bit about the the force itself and the kinds of people who volunteered um and and how did you i mean did they take you to work? Like you, you knew you started to learn a lot of lingo. Oh I could yeah, tell. yeah. Oh okay, yeah. I want to hear about it. By the end, I be, I was I was inducted into the Tasley Fire Department as a support member, which was really 
like so cool. it was and this and this is the fire department that was headed by the fu go away fire chief so that was it was a it was a hugely moving triumph um so here, here's something that I didn't know. And living in a city, you, you might know it, not know it either. Um, something like 80% of all fire departments in America are, are volunteer-based. It's actually pretty rare to have, to have a paid fire staff. So all of the people in Accomac who were going out almost every night to fight these fires had, um, had day jobs or night jobs that were they worked on crabbing boats or they um or they drove trucks or um they uh they worked for poultry plants the largest the largest employer there is tyson's um so so these were men and one woman lots of men and one woman who uh who who night after night were were being called out of sleep after they'd it already worked a full shift or a double shift, um, and and in a, in a way that I found really interesting, this was a this was a a terrible time, but it was sort of a wonderful time to be a firefighter in Accomac um, because they really became the heroes mm -hmm. of of the county, um, in in deserved ways and in ways that I think made them feel seen. So in trying to reconstruct what right. it was like, um, yeah, I, I slept in the firehouse. I went out on fire calls. I learned how, how to clean the hoses and fold the hoses. Uh -huh. And it was with dish soap, with, with Dawn dish soap Dawn specifically. Dish soap. Okay. Yes. It has to, this, this, there's a brand that works particularly well. Yes. Oh, interesting. Yes. Didn't know. Um, and what would you say um, the typical home life situation was for these volunteers? I mean, at the time of the at the time of the fires, like, like I said, it, it was really. Um, I mean, they're they're re they're regular folks. They they they're married and they have kids at home, or they they're single and they're looking. They're 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 leading these regular lives. But at the time of the fires. Um, they all, you know, sort of brought their laundry baskets and moved into the firehouse and um, because they knew that at some point every night their their pagers were going to go off. So they might as well right. be at the firehouse to start. Right. So a, a whole culture started. Uh, my favorite story was that the Tasley Firehouse um, started entering these Call of Duty competitions. Um, because they got they got so good at <laughs> at playing were, together, they were in this amazing mind meld wow. that that it was like this this is the ancillary benefit. You are going out. You're you are dealing with the worst arsonist in the history of the state of Virginia. Simultaneously, you are getting really good at Call of Duty. <laughs> yeah. Something that occurred to me, um, I don't know if you've been following the case, but um, when the Golden State Killer um, was identified, um, it turned out that he was, he had been a police officer. Yeah. Um, and in this case, of course, the perpetrator of these fires um, had been a volunteer fireman. Yeah. Is, do you think that there's a link there in terms of getting knowledge about how to do something well yeah so yeah. it's it's actually it's not uncommon for for arsonists to be firefighters um because if you think about it the, the same thing that would draw you to um to to want to be at the scene of action to want to be in in the middle of things the same thing that would draw you to want to put out a fire um <laughs> you know might draw you to want to light one, especially it's it's not uncommon for firefighters to um, to light fires because they love so much being called to put them out. Um, so so they'll light a fire just so they can get the thrill of going to you know to extinguish it. Um, it was a little bit different with this particular firefighter. He didn't really fit many of the of the tropes. Um, and, and also in Accomac, honestly, everyone's a volunteer firefighter. <laughs> there's, there's nothing else to do there. It's, right. it's a, that's what you do for social life. So, and so you went to all the potlucks and the barbecues and, oh yeah. Um, the, <laughs> like the bingo games and, um, 
like on Wednesday nights, they all watch Tattoo Inc. Like that's that's a big <laughs> that's deal. A big so yeah, cool. Um, and so you came to this case after um, you had found out who done it. Yeah. Um, but there was still a lot to investigate and report. Um, I guess my my craft question is, how do you create tension when you when we already know the ending. So for me, this story was never interesting as a as a who done it. Um, I knew when I started to write the book who 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 had done it. What what propelled me to go down there and and live with this story for as long as I did was 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 why it happened. And and to me that was the mystery because that's not really a, that's not a mystery about fire that's sort of a mystery of the the human heart and why we why we do anything and why we want anything and sort of the depths that we'll go to for the people we love and that that's what this story was about the story was about bizarre human frailties and trying to, un tr to uncover that rather than just we made an arrest and we got the right guy. Right. Um, and so how much research into the, um, the arsonists had you done beforehand? Um, did you do any investigating of them while writing the book? What did you learn? When did you talk to them? That kind of stuff. So when I, when I started, like I said, the, these two people who were arrested, their names are Charlie and Tanya. They were um, they they were involved in the community. He he ran a body shop. She ran a clothing store next to the body shop. Everyone knew who they were. Um, I I ended up becoming f friends is not the right word, but like Charlie called me yesterday. Charlie and I still talk all the time. Um, because he was really, uh, he really understood that he'd done a, a bad thing. And he was, he wanted to talk because, as he said to me, the, the first time uh, we ever spoke, which, which was him calling me in response to a letter that I'd sent him, um, he said, I've lived in Accomack my whole life. Everybody that I know lives in Accomack. Um, Everybody that I've ever met thinks I'm a bad person now. And I just, you know, I, I just kind of like people to understand why we did it and why, why this happened. So um, Char Charlie was willing. Um, Tanya, different circumstance. Yeah, I mean, T Tanya Bundick is a woman that I am still d deeply fascinated by. She is, she's sort of like a great redneck femme fatale in, in, in all of the complicated ways. Um, and she, she sat for an, an interview with me that was, um, that was a couple of hours long and then decided she didn't want to participate anymore which um you know which, which made her a, a little more difficult so i ended up um you know interviewing her family members and her old boyfriends and people who had gone to high school with her right. and and trying to sift through who this enigmatic person was you recreate with great detail some of the times when she was at the local bar yeah <laughs> and and how magnetic she was she uh you know for for Akamak, she was really hot shit i like, i don't know how else to say it she was um <laughs> she was she was very pretty and she had a great body and she knew she did and she wore what flattered it and um and she she was she was part of the scene everybody everybody knew her and that made people either hate her or want to be with her, but she wasn't a person that you had really lukewarm feelings about. You had strong feelings about her. Um, but, but she was one of the few people in Accomac who everybody already knew who she was before the arsons. And then the fact that she was the one lighting the fires was, was baffling and perplexing and um, 
it's added a layer of weirdness onto the whole already deeply weird thing. As a couple, were, did the town of, or the county of Accomac find Charlie and Tanya compatible? Did it make sense to them? Um, was, was it a great love? I mean, they think it was, and that's kind of the point of it. Like, what, all relationships make perfect sense while you're in them, and then if <laughs> yes. they end, are just batshit afterward. I mean, I think, I think <laughs> even the people away. in them have a hard time explaining. And these are, no, like, these are normal relationships. I look back <laughs> on some of my past relationships, and I don't know what happened there, and I didn't burn down any buildings <laughs> as far as I can remember. Um, so... So it was, it was, a, it felt like a great love story at the time that went wrong in a way that was hard to pinpoint how, it was hard to say how wrong it was getting while it was happening. Um, what I will say is that the people of Accomac feel a lot of sympathy toward Charlie. Mm. Uh, most of them do not feel much sympathy toward Tanya. Um, which I think is really interesting. And I think some of that is personality related. I think that some of that is uh, that we think bad girls are a lot badder than we think bad mm. boys are. And th that, that Charlie gets a, a pass because he was sort of an aw shucks. Poor Charlie was, was led astray by a, a bad woman. So I think that there was part of that too. And do you think that played out in the justice system and in and, and, and their punishments? It occurred to me tonight that I might say the phrase rural juror. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think it did. And I think it did in, in ways like, um, like in, in Tanya's trials, because they were tried separately and there were a lot of trials. Uh, the prosecutor made a large point of the fact that while they were setting these fires, she had left two kids at home alone. Mm. Um, Charlie was also leaving kids home alone. Right. I don't know that the prosecutor would have gone out of his way to point out that, that Charlie was being a derelict parent, but, but they knew that pointing out that Tanya was being a derelict parent would hit, hit, a, hit a lot closer. It's, it's worse for a mother to be doing right. this kind of thing. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated that you spoke to Charlie yesterday. Um, tell me a little bit about the reactions of, of so many of the characters in the book um, and, and how did they feel to be characters in your book? And did they feel like they had got good representation? They, they, they really did. Um, and I feel like, I mean, I feel like this sort of like self-congratulatory to say, I mean, what am I going to like stand up here and tell you that everyone hated the book and I messed it up. <laughs> um, but, but, but by the time the book came out, I think um, you like, like I said, people were really worried about me writing this book because they didn't want to look like Hicks and mm -hmm. they didn't want to look like the police didn't want to look like idiots. Like why mm -hmm. did it take you five months to, catch these people right who by the way the police interviewed several times during right. the investigation and never realized they were talking to the arsonists um so i would say their expectations were were low um <laughs> right. but but by the time the book came out nobody who's in the book um would have been surprised by the content. I did. I had a lot of conversations. I. I would. If. If I was going to describe someone in a way I thought might be unflattering, I. I would read them the description ahead of time and just say, "This. This is how I talk about you. What do you think?" Yeah. Um, so it was. I, I will say that last week, which is the first day the paperback came out, mm -hmm. I went down to Chincoteague, which is. Um, part of Accomack County and I did a reading at a bookstore there and there were about 150 people and I knew that every single one of them was either in the book or knew someone who mm -hmm. was and that was a really scary reading it was a much scary that was a really, was really like that could have gone sideways in a lot of ways but um but the community reaction has actually been really positive right. tell me a little bit about the Q&A <laughs> 
in that evening? You know, uh, well, a lot of a lot of people just there just because they they lived through it. Right. They kind of just wanted the chatty, gossipy updates that you might want from mm -hmm. your your neighbor talking over the fence. What's right. what's Tanya up to now? What's Charlie up to now? Right. Um, the, the, who's going to play me in the movie? Like, do you have any say over who's going to play me in the movie? Like, a, a lot of it was, was stuff like that. And That's also, great. I mean, I think that we're always interested in how outsiders perceive us. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of the, a lot of people from Akamak, when they write me or email me are asking questions about, um, like asking me to make sense of life in Akamak. Right. To which I sort of think, well, I don't know. You li you, <laughs> you live, live there, there. Um, but uh, but you know, I think that they want validation or they they want to know. Um, well, I think this, but I'm I'm deep in it. So how does it come across to you? Sure. Yeah. And and are there updates in in Charlie and Tanya's cases? Is there? They're both still in prison. Right. Um, where they will be for a long time. Quite a while. Um. Charlie, when we, <laughs> this will be both disappointing and also completely sensical to those of you who have read the book. Um, when I started talking to Charlie, he was still so deeply in love with Tanya and would talk about her as if she was the love of his life. Since then, uh, he's had two more loves of his life cycle okay. through and has made just deeply boneheaded decisions <laughs> related on to those. I mean, pe sure. uh, one of the things that, that the reader, that the, um, the folks in, in Akamak asked me when I did the reading was, at, what, at some point, these people are going to come back into the community. And when they do, do you think they will start lighting fires again? Like, huh. like should we be, be worried? worried? Wow. Um, and here's the thing about Charlie. He is, I think, a, f a fundamentally decent arsonist slash human. <laughs> but if he got out and fell in love and met another woman who was like, you know what, let's burn down some more buildings, <laughs> he would. Right. Just like he would rob a bank for right. someone who suggested that that was a good thing to do. Sure. He's a... He's a He's easily influenced. Sure. Yeah. And Tanya? So one of the things that I find fascinating about Tanya is that I don't think anyone will ever fully know why she did the things she did, including herself. I don't think she fully even understands her own motives. Um, I... I fantasized that one day I would get to have a conversation with her where she was ready to be honest and, and sort of inquiring into her own behavior, but she's not there yet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, without giving too much away, um, you talk about a thing in the book called The Thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, how much Freudian theory uh, goes into talking about motivation when we're talking about Charlie and Tanya? There's a lot. <laughs> so, so here, here are other things in the in the vast topic of things I did not know about arson that I that I now know. When you talk about uh, w when you talk about arsonists, there's there's fire setting, which is the act of setting a fire, and that's a behavior. And people can set fires for all sorts of different reasons. It can be, you know, a kid can set fire because he doesn't want to go to school, and so he's going to trigger a fire alarm or whatever. There are lots of different reasons people can set fires. So fire setting is a behavior. Arson is a crime. Arson is when uh, you, you light something that shouldn't be lit. Um, pyromania is a psychological disorder that comprises an incredibly small percent of, of arson. Usually we use, um, we use those terms interchangeably. But actually, most arsonists are not pyromaniacs. Um, 
pyromania has to do with like all of the all of the weird movie of the week things that we think of when we think about um, the when we think about sex and twisted behavior and 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 all of this culminating in a fire. Um, so when I was when I was interviewing uh, expert investigators ab about this book, I had a couple of them tell me I've been doing this for 40 years. I think these might have been the only pyromaniacs I've ever wow. encountered. Um, so it, it really was a, it was a pretty it was a, it was it was an unusual crime in, in every way that a crime can be unusual. And let's talk about just for a second the costs of, of what happened. So there's the financial and the time on people, but but was anybody injured ever? No, and and if if anyone had been, I mean, it would have been a very different, different kind of story. Yeah. Would have been a really different kind of story, because no one was the town had really complicated reactions to what this meant to them. There, were, there was a not small percentage of people whose reaction to the fire was sort of like, God, I'm glad someone burned that building down. You <laughs> right, know? Or, right. or like, like, maybe these are vigilantes who are doing this for the good of the community. We have mm. a lot of abandoned buildings. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's like beautification experts who are trying <laughs> right. to, to solve the problem of, of rural blight. So um, it was, again, it's part of why I, I, I loved it because it was, it was stressful, it was bad, it was illegal, it was expensive, but it was, it was not uncomplicated. It was a complicated series of crimes. Sure. Um, and so in Accomac now, I mean, has, the debris been picked up? Ha has there been any rebuilding? Is is it just getting more desolate? You know, Accomack is it's a it's a rural county, but it's it's a big place. It's forty miles long. It's it, so there are a lot of different parts. There's okay. there's a town called Only that when I was down there last week, they've got a brand new coffee shop that's the cutest coffee shop you've ever been to. So there are, there Great. are pockets like that. Um, there are other buildings that are still standing, and you'll hear people joke like, "We need another arsonist to to take the, to take those down." So um, it's 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 unchanged, and the fact that it's unchanged for the most part is is what, in some ways, got it into the state that it's in now because sure. it's it's a it's a county that's been doing things the same way for hundreds of years while the rest of the world changes around it and they're they're trying to figure out how to how to catch up and and what life should look like now thank you is there does anybody have a question um there's a mic oh okay hi <laughs> woman i don't know <laughs> who happens to be is, monica's editor yes but i have not asked this before my question is um Clearly, as you say, you were regarded with suspicion as an outsider who was going to sort of tell the world some kind of version of the story. And then you endeared yourself over time to the community as a whole and also to a lot of individuals who now have received the book well. That's a very complicated, and yet clearly, I mean, obviously I'm familiar with the book. You are not, it's not a, um, you're not heaping praise on every person in the book. I think it's a very, you know, balanced nuanced portrayal. I mean, how was it? Did you ever find yourself really struggling kind of emotionally with how to navigate the personal and professional boundaries of these relationships? And also just how did you learn how to be such a good, sensitive journalist and um, person? <laughs> That was such a plant question. That's like, that's like my mom's in the audience. She's like, how did you get so wonderful? Um, So when I think about the book and I think about the narrator of the book, to me, the way that I always have thought about it is that the narrator of the book is the county. It's, it's the county telling the story. And so um, there doesn't need to be much of a place for my observations or anything that, that I think uh, if I was going to put something in the book, I was going to put it in there because someone who lives there felt that way. Um, 
And so when I wrote about Jeff Bell, for example, the uh, fuck you go away fire chief, everyone I met told me that he's, he's an amazing fire chief who is also really hard to like as a person because he's a, he's a total hard ass and has no patience for mistakes. Um, and so when I, when I, when I work on the book, I, I just try to be really transparent. I would just say, Jeff, a lot of people seem to not like you and think you're a hard ass. And, and that wasn't news to him. I mean, he, he knew that. And so I feel like my, my job is never to, uh, To, to glide to glide over that but but what my job is is to understand like this is what people think about Jeff but why is Jeff that way where does what how does he view himself how do the arsonists view themselves how do the crazy people riding around in camouflage paint trying to catch the arsonists how do, how do they view themselves um I'm answering this in such a meandering way, and I just finally came to the way that I want to say it. Um, I, I've been a writer and a journalist for a long time, and I have yet to meet anyone who thinks that they're a bad person. Everyone thinks that they are the hero of their own story. And so I feel like my, my job is often not to judge whether that is true or not, but to try to understand why why do you think you're the hero of your story what what did what were you doing that made that made sense to you that that brought us here and so what i what i hope the book does is it lets everyone in it be the hero of their own story including including charlie and tanya who uh did a really crazy bad thing but um something that in a weird way seemed like the right thing to be doing at the time Hi, um, I think a lot of people scoff at true cr crime as a genre, but obviously there's terrific stuff being doing, be, be, you know, being written in the genre. I think in documentary film as well. I recently saw the Netflix documentary Evil Genius, which also had a femme fatale. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little about the genre and, you know, why you think it's it's become such a good genre in recent years and so much solid stuff being done in it. I mean, I'll, I'll say that I think it's it's always been a, a, a good genre, but has gotten a bad rap for a long time because people who don't read it or aren't familiar with it think of it as just being a really stereotypical, hard-boiled detective, you know, e either that sort of reductive, um, you know, facile, bo boring, formulaic, type of book or or they think that it's um that it's that it's leering that it's like rubbernecking at an accident and that it's deliberately dwelling in in depravity um but i think that the best the best true crime has has always been about um you know has has always been a, about a lot of a lot more than that it's it's always been about uh this human psychology and about society. Um, one of the things that I talk about in this book is how these arsons about the literal burning of rural America were really symbolic to the metaphorical burning of rural America. And I think that you, you see that in the best true crime. You see um, books about the 1920s, uh, jazz killers, these, these women who murdered their husbands in the 20s are, are sort of about women murdering their husbands in the 20s, but they're also about the fact that uh, women had just gotten the right to vote and society as a whole was struggling with what that, what that meant and what liberation of women was, was going to look like. So I, I think that, that Crime is just another lens to look at the world and the way that that the world is being shaped and the forces that are shaping it, and the you know, the the best crime novels do that. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations for some of the the best ones you've seen aside from? 
American Fire, of course, which should all buy or. So the one that the one that I g gave a shout out to um, at the end of the book, there's a. It's, it might be out of print now. It's a little hard to find. There's a book about uh, the Leopold and Loeb killings written by Hal Higdon, and it's called Leopold and Loeb. And it's, I think what's, what's so great about it is that it's not about the killings so much as it's about, um, it's about Chicago in the 19-teens and the country in the 19-teens and our growing understanding of, um, of, of were people, you know, were people evil or was it uh, like man, you know, there, there, Nietzsche is involved, it's like phrenology is involved. We were just kind of learning how to grapple with what it meant for someone to be a, a bad person. So they, I think that that's a really fascinating book. Anyone else? I've got one. Uh oh, do you? Um, so I don't know much about arson outside of like what it actually is. So I'm curious if like this case of like these two people burning down like what was it like 85 buildings? Yeah. If that's considered like a huge landmark in like the history of like arson in America, or if there's like other cases that are like similar or like I guess like way more. I don't know. Just curious about like the history, I guess. So there's a couple ways to answer that. Um, one is this. This is the most prolific arsonist in the history of the state of Virginia. In other places, like there was a, an arsonist in the early 90s in Los Angeles who lit 400 buildings on fire. So like, that's really a lot. Um, but the other way to answer that is to say, you saying you don't know a lot about arson is sort of the state that law enforcement is in. Law enforcement doesn't know a lot about arson either. And part of that is because only 15% of arsonists are ever caught. So they're thinking of that 85% of all arson cases go unsolved. So what does that mean? Does that mean that out of 100 arsons, like the 85, does that mean 85 different individuals are building down one burning down one building a piece? Or does that mean that it's two of them and they're each burning down 42 and a half? Like we, we really don't know. And in some ways, you could look at it like the ones who get caught must have been the bad arsonists because <laughs> they were caught. So like we, we think that arsonists are um, typically male. Uh, we think that they typically have a slightly lower IQ and a slightly, we think that they're, they're uneducated. Does that mean that that's what arsonists are? Like, no, it just means that that's the 15% the of the ones we've caught that that's This, was, this one was atypical because there was one. It was atypical because there were two people working together. Usually, it's a solo crime. So there were there were reasons that made it different, but uh, we don't know enough to know how how different. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, uh, what's next up next on your radar? Like any big projects, a book, um, another crime to cover? Um, what's next for you? So. Um, I have a weird career. Um, I alternate between, I've, I've, this is my first nonfiction book. I also write uh, young adult fiction. So I have a book coming out in September that's historical, that's historical fiction for teenagers that has nothing to do with arson or crimes <laughs> of any kind. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's it's called The War Outside and it is, um, it's set in the, it's a, uh, it's historical fiction, um, but it's set in a, in a real place in the only American internment camp that had both Japanese and German families in it in World War II. Oh. Yeah. Excellent. And don't forget to mention gender. Oh, and I've, <laughs> I, I've, so you introduced me as a feature writer for the Washington Post, which, is, which was true until last week. Um, I'm starting a new job as a columnist <laughs> at the Washington Post. Yeah. So exciting. I think we had one more question here. I have, I have a tacky Acomet County question. Who would you cast as Tanya and Charlie? Or, and what can you share about anyone who might be bringing those roles to life? So um, the, the, the book has been optioned um, 
for for television development, I'm never sure how much I'm allowed to say about it. Yeah. So, um, so if any of you watch uh, watch Fargo on television, the the guy who runs Fargo has optioned it to uh, to develop it for FX, um, which I think is. Is, he's, he's the perfect guy to do it, and it's the perfect station for it to be on. Um, if I if I could cast Charlie, I would cast um, Sam Rockwell. Although, yeah, I although if anyone saw Three Billboards Outside of yeah. yeah, so so I went to see that movie, and it was like, well, crap, he's already played Charlie. <laughs> like this this already is Charlie. So I I might have to re think that because I think he's he's so perfect for the role he's essentially just played the role um, for Tanya I always I think of someone like Jessica Chastain who's a really who's really kind of s steely and hard and has a, a an intelligence to her I think Great. the only person who's actually sent in a request is Jeff Bell, the Tasley fire chief, regularly emails asking if Tom Selleck is available to play him. <laughs> That's incredible, and I support him. I, I support, <laughs> who doesn't? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, mighty audience. And you'll sign some books over there.